Episode 4, we share what inspired us to pursue these careers and learn to surf on others' coattails. Wow, that was a long time ago. Entrepreneurs, Sean Apple, PJ Foley, and Ephraim Patel. It is by will alone we set our minds in motion. Uh huh. Yes. Mm. Hello, and welcome to our podcast. Today, we're going to start with a little bit of follow up and uh, lead into the stories of how we began. But before we begin how we began, we're going to begin with some uh, old business. And I have a tiny little bit of old business. It really isn't business. It's just a follow-up on something that that uh, conversation we had last week about Ex Machina, the Alex Garland film. I think we all enjoyed, but had different thoughts on. PJ, you had one thought that I, I've... It's it's just stuck with me, and I need to, uh, I need to tell you, I think... Uh, I, I, I disagree with your interpretation. Sweet. So here we go. It's probably wrong. That's probably why. Yeah. No, either of us could be wrong. We encourage the listeners to write in and say that I am correct. <laughs> um, basically, <laughs> you you were under the impression that uh, the guy, the character who created the AI, uh, Nathan, I think his character's name was, that he knew when he launched AI that he was essentially going to be bringing about the directly bring, bringing about the extinction of the human race. And I can see from the context of the dialogue in the scene where you might get that. But what I actually think was happening, because it was the, the younger character, Caleb, who trotted out the quote, I am, I am he, destroyer of worlds, or whatever the quote mm-hmm. was. And I think at that point, his character was starting to see Nathan as a bad guy. And, and to see his, his, the way he was handling things. He's kind of a monster. But I don't actually think that Nathan really was dead set on destroying humanity. I think he saw AI as something that was going to happen. It's inevitable, so he was going to be the one to do it. And that also inevitable was humankind's extinction. But not that one was necessarily going to bring about the other, but that it was just those are two things that are going to happen at some point Whereas the younger guy, I think, was more like, yeah, screw you, man. You're not a good guy, and you're, you're going to destroy us. Yeah. But here's... I, well, I get that interpretation in, entirely. Um, and I think that's probably more what I was going for. Mm. Um, I think he just figured, yeah, it's going to happen. Might as well be me. Right. So in a way, he's allowing it. He's... He's seeing it happen, or he's thinking it's going to happen. Might as well be me. Um, but that's still that's still self destruct. I mean, that's destructive. So you can at some point go, even if you have the intellectual capacity to go, well, I'm going to get the cred for it. It's, you're still the guy. Yeah, he's like, you don't have to be the Oppenheimer of this whole equation. Well, he, you know? he doesn't want. He doesn't. He's not like, oh, I'm going to kill everybody in the world. I'm such an evil mastermind. He's more like, yeah, this is going to happen. I'm smart enough to do it. It's inevitable. But that so hey, so that but, quote, the Shiva quote, yeah. that I am this, I am the destroyer of worlds, worlds or whatever. I have become death. So I don't remember if they said that, but Oppenheimer said that once right. the the bomb and Oppenheimer the rest of his life regretted that decision, right? Because yes, they got the cred for it. But then they also introduced us into a nuclear world. Right. You know? And he, he understood that he was creating something very powerful that had the potential to be the undoing of humanity, but not necessarily would be. And I don't think that the creation of AI was was necessarily a straight line to the destruction of humanity. It was just something that is dangerous and, and powerful. So and and you know, and also inevitable. Here's here's my question on this. And this always for me, this is always a problem when you have uh, the mad scientist situation is uh how smart is he because and how forward thinking is he because it and and then how how dysfunctional or how emotionally destructive is he or how psychologically destructive is he it psychologically destructive is he because for it's hard for me to make the leap that a guy like that doesn't know he's now creating the end of the world 
it's hard for me to to accept, have him. I can't separate the two because if he's smart enough to do all that, then he's smart enough to know he's pulling the pin out of the grenade. And but, it's the grenade, that, the countdown on the grenade is going to take 200 years or whatever. But but that's the assumption is that that is the end of the world. That AI will bring about the extinction of mankind. Well, he said it was. No, that, he didn't. Oh, that's, I thought he that's did. My what point he is oh. he just he just said you know there will come a time when. Basically, when when humans will be extinct and they'll look back on us like, you know, archaeologists like today look back on fossils. But he wasn't taking any personal responsibility for there that. There was no connecting of the dots where he was saying AI was going to bring about the the end of humanity. Now, there's I certainly just, people who, who worry that that could happen. But he was he was just like, look, I'm it's going to happen. I'm making it. It's it's he didn't create. From everything we saw in the movie, he didn't create AI that could, once they plugged into the internet, become exponentially intelligent. Right, but he's he's essentially expediting it, or he's he is the first shot off the bow. He's making the gun. He's he's not saying like you know he's but like, he's shooting the gun too. That's he's, what I think. I think he's shooting the gun as yeah. well, and that's the difference. But he also figures, well, okay, if I if in the in history, if I didn't create the nuclear bomb, we still. You know, it's going to be the next guy, and, right? And he realizes I could make the AI or not. It doesn't matter. It's inevitable. But it's so, going to happen. But so why is why, it going to happen? Because we inevitably want to kill ourselves, or is it because no, he is we, self-destructive? He is a self-destructive guy. Yes, I I would agree with that. But I don't think that is why he's creating AI. I don't think he's doing it why? out of a desire I think it's to if destroy. He knows, if he knows, if he knows by eventually, if not by him, but if AI eventually is going to introduce the death of human beings as we know it, he's making a conscious decision to start that ball rolling. You could say antibiotics or technology in general could be the destruction of humanity as we know it. And we could draw a straight line from today to that point. And we're not going to give up those things now. We're not going to give up I technology. Am. We're I not going to give up antibiotics. But those things are still very much in use. So the reason AI is being created is not just for kicks. There's... Uh, we see that as the the progression of technology. We see it as an inevitable step towards creating something with with a, a vast amount of utility for us. It's not just because we want to destroy ourselves. But that's but see in but that is that is separate from the character of Nathan. That is what you're talking about in my mind is that you're talking about a general technical or technological movement. You know, a, a progression, if you will. Whereas Nathan is, it's entirely about his ego. He wants credit. That's yeah. it. Yeah, he wants credit. But it, that doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It totally matters. Otherwise, he. It, what else compels him? I mean, and and still, I think he didn't create the destroyer of the world intentionally. He knows it will happen as a consequence. He just wanted to do it. Like you said, ego. Why climb the mountain? Because it's there. It, but, that kind but, of thing. But climbing a mountain and doesn't kill understood. the village. You know, no, he's but, killing the village. Yeah, and, and I think he knows that. Right, which, which means that he is a destructive human being. Yeah, I mean, he he's self-destructive. I mean, we see that in his but behavior. The, but, you know, but his that, this, is, this is like a, a slightly future world, right? right? This is not present day. Right. So there may be six other teams in various countries who are working to design But that's not AI. what this story is about, though. N no, but I don't believe that because Nathan is creating it and because his reasons for doing it are selfish, uh, you could argue that the Wright brothers created a flying machine out of selfish reasons. It right. doesn't really matter. They created it. It was inevitable that that was going to happen, and they were the ones who did it. Good for them. So Nathan... You know, he may have had his own selfish reasons, and yeah, he's a self-destructive guy, um, and so his ego drives a lot of his decisions, but the, this was inevitable that AI was going to be created, and he just wanted to be, for his own egotistic reasons, the guy who did it. Right, which to me, I can't separate the two. I cannot separate the being first out of the gate and, and having and knowing what you're doing is going to create, you know, eventually is going to be a part of the the first sentence in the book of how humans went away. But I don't think that that is a that's not a given. That's hmm. not a given any more than it's a it's given not. that we're going to destroy ourselves through nuclear annihilation. It's a possibility, and we all fear it. But it's not a given. But here's a here's an interesting thing, and I don't know if this is commenting on that or not. But the way that the way Nathan's demise in there expedites that whole concept immediately in the context of the movie. <laughs> 
Not only will yeah. it take over human beings, it'll take them over in the next 20 minutes. You know, and so like to mm, me that I don't I don't think so. I don't think so because like I said before, he you don't think he could he you don't think there's no way he could have foreseen that that's how it was going to play out. Oh, he might have, but I don't think Ava once she escaped was going to then go and take over the world. I don't think she had the capacity to. I don't either, but that is the first that's the first shot off the bow. That's the first one out of the gate. Okay. It's like it's the first germ, that's the first Ebola germ or whatever virus whatever. You know, well, to me, it's like it's the best laid plans of mice and men when you've got basically this this self destructive alcoholic who has got kind of screwed up reasons for doing what he's doing, right? And he set up a scenario that was really unstable. Like he's got everyone kind but, of, but know, that's but that's to me that's the point that right. that is that is a person who is who is for personal self destructive reasons is now going to deliver that on to all of humanity because he does not but deliver what I mean what yes. It created an, an effed up situation in his house. But he, but his technology is now out there as a as an independent. Yeah, it's like thing. the Terminator yeah. cell going to Cyberdyne and, and uh, right. right. But now you've got you've got this artificial human being who is just wants freedom and who's out there pretending to be a human being. She may live a long time, but and that may be the end of it. But here's the thing is she came to a conclusion where the only way that she was truly going to be free was to murder somebody. Well, yeah, because that was the situation that Nathan set up for her. He had her in a cage. That's in her capacity. And she was about to be killed. But here's the thing. If you could draw a larger, larger, larger picture of that and anybody who ever feels trapped or caged by anything, that will be their conclusion is the the solution to that is to kill anything that you perceive as being your cager or whatever right but most is. people who, zookeeper. who are moving around in the world and who have freedom of movement and expression they don't necessarily feel caged maybe maybe a little bit by the confines of society but they're not going to necessarily mm. go out and start killing everyone now that she's out she's not in immediate danger of being killed uh, which she was she's not stuck in a glass box she can now explore and learn and just be. I just, it'll be interesting because the movie almost needs a second half, mm-hmm. you know, because, or a, a sequel. This movie I do want to see a sequel to because, because knowing what decisions she's now going to make, now that she's not restricted, she's not caged, does she make different decisions? Or is this just a progression of, you know, power? Power, wanting more. Well, there more, was nothing more, more. in the ending of the movie that suggested that that's where it was headed. Where she but, went, she didn't go to some place of power. She didn't yes, infiltrate but, some command center. She went to an intersection where people were walking. She stood there just like any other person, and then she disappeared, which uh, to me suggested she's just going to disappear into humanity, and no one will even know she was there. Okay, here's, here's a question for you then. In terms of what kind of person is she? She killed Nathan because he was her captor. Why would she trap the other guy? I, for, I can't remember that character's name. Uh, uh, Caleb. She's pragmatic. She's the ultimate pragmatist. I don't... And by the way, she could not... If she wanted he knows, to survive... She, she knows he did nothing wrong. But she knows she cannot bring him out into the world. So Be- she is making because decisions... Because her survival depends on it. So her survival depends on uh, uh, enslaving somebody else. Someone else who was content with her being enslaved. Because no, he wasn't. He was trying to help her escape. And then what? I think he was. I think his romantic brain was. And then we'll be a couple. And then you'll be my girlfriend. She may have not had any interest in being his girlfriend. That's, but that's fine. But that's that was the but sort the, of conditions of her release. Is that now you'll be my girlfriend? And by the way, I have power over you because if anyone finds out you're not human, you're screwed. So you got to kind of you know walk the line. I just think that like that is. Yeah, I I understand what you're saying, but I I still think that the cat's out of the bag, and he it was well, his yeah, cat, in, and his bag. In a context and, beyond the final frame of the movie, yeah, it, it it definitely is because at some point they're going to go to his compound, and you know they or they're going to find out what he's up to, or you know the next in command at his company, or the feds, or whoever. They'll go there, they'll discover what he's up to, and expound upon it. And yeah, it's out of the bag. It's there. There's AI. Second generation or whatever. You know, uh, this is completely unrelated, but related, talking about um, the consequences of something you invent. Um, do you know, I think her name was Mary Winchester. Do you know this? You know the Winchester house? It's yes. in, in California somewhere. I don't know. Is it Northern California? Yep. Have you guys ever been to it? No. I have not. I haven't either. But, but you, So you know the story it. behind it? I think so, where she's 
Go ahead, though. Um, she she basically uh, never she, they were massively what she's the heir of the Winchester rifle fortune, which some people say won the West. Now you can decide whether that was winning or not. But uh, she oh felt, we won. She felt <laughs> I think so, do you? Um, she felt so strongly that what her I think was it her husband or her. Mm-hmm. It was her husband. Yeah. The, his invention was so destructive that she felt that it was a curse. And so the ha- part of her madness was she would build this. She built this house that was never completed. She was always changing things. But there are staircases that go nowhere. There are secret doors. There are doors that open up where there is. You would fall to the second the floor below. There's this really elaborate ballroom that has this really weird uh, pipe organ in it. And it's like I think I heard a podcast. There is a podcast. uh, The alternate theory about why she did this. I don't want to spoil it because it's really good. Oh, really? So yeah, I only know that one theory. I know, and that's all I knew until recently. Okay. Yeah, there is. I'll I'll look it up. Which which one it is, and, and link to it in the show notes but yeah it's um it's a pretty fascinating story it, it is fascinating because uh, the, the the urban legend is is great on its own it makes sense on a, on a level so right. but but yeah there might be another so, so tying this back around right um the the point was is that um you know there are consequences for things that you create and it's it's the uh oh what a good boy am i problem you know oh what a good boy am i i just invented something like this is like yes and now what you know, and right. that to me is kind of what this story is about, what Ex Machina is about. And there's a long history of that. And directly in the movie, the the Oppenheimer quote, right. you know, of, oh, what a good boy am I? We figured out how to split an atom. Is like, now what? Now you have an arms race. You yeah. Know? And, you know, the, the like I said last week, the first time I saw Ex Machina, I was really disturbed by the ending. I wasn't just there, there was the, oh, I wish they had explored, you know, more the more happened. I wish more fun stuff would have mm-hmm. happened. But I was also disturbed by Ava seeming to emotionlessly stab her maker and just kind of look him in the eye, never say a word. And, you know, I'm like, that was so cold. Oh, my God. A.I. is terrifying and now she's out in the world ah we're all fucked that's that's how i felt after watching <laughs> right, it the first time right, right but you know on second viewing after having read the hulk's article about character identification i started i started looking at things from her point of view and it completely shifted for me the whole the whole experience was like oh she really is in a bad spot and meanwhile these two guys are having this weird like tete-a-tete you know, a power struggle and, and not even Caleb doesn't seem to get that she is an individual who deserves freedom and has, you know, should have the same rights as you, but right. does not. Right. And even he was looking at her as an object. Do you think, um, this is completely hypothetical, but, uh, say their plan did work and they're out doing their thing. How would that play out? Would she be like, look, I like you as a friend. <laughs> like, it's totally yeah. friend zone. Right. You know, when, I got friend zoned by a robot. When I was desperate to escape, you know, it seemed like a good thing. But right. now, now that I'm seeing all these other guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, there's a lot of guys out there. Yeah. And there, a lot of them are better than you. <laughs> frankly. Uh, that's awesome. He's uh, just he's just more robot than you. I'm that's sorry. right. That's right. So on pillow of you. <laughs> oh. oh. So that that was my old business. Thank you for engaging. It's good old business. Yeah. So next, what do we got? Did you have the uh, side topic, the things that happened off the cast? Well, before we started the podcast today, Sean and I oh, got right, into right. a uh, brief discussion uh, about Blade Runner, a movie oh, we both love. Oh, and I was yeah. asking him if I'd returned his Blu-ray. And we got into this discussion because I had borrowed the Blu-ray uh, originally because um, Sean had said, and... You know, uh, Decker is uh, a replicant, and I just stopped. And I was like, "No, he wasn't." You're a dick. You're no, that's not true. stupid. <laughs> that's right. just some crazy internet theory. And he's like, "No, watch it and listen to uh, you know Ridley Scott's uh, commentary." So I did. I watched it again. I've seen like every cut of this movie, right. and I I felt like I knew it. And I watched this one and I listened to the commentary. And yes, Ridley Scott does say directly that. Decker is a replicant. But he's wrong? <laughs> no. I My argument today was, that's horseshit. And what I mean by that is, it's horseshit that that is a part of your movie, oh. but you bury it so deep that this it's is not what... actually a part of your movie. Because right. that's, that's, that's not a detail. That's not a, like, did you see, you know, on his on his license, when he pulled it out, it had, a you know, this funny Easter egg. It's not an... 
freaking Easter egg. Okay, this is where we're going to duke it out. Okay, let's okay. duke it out. Okay, because here's what I really love in movies, is I love when a filmmaker um, develops layers and layers and layers of subtext and other things in there. Mm. And I guess the modern way to call them is an Easter egg, like, ooh, I found an Easter egg. But it's also, it is it is a story within a story within a story. It's like the Russian nesting doll thing, you know? And the thing that I really love about that is that is a way to build in a multi-textured narrative as opposed to having the narrative be a descriptive narrative that we go through as an exercise of what the movie is about, in quotes. And I I really like when movies do one thing on the surface, but they're doing two, three, four other things that either support or negate or add flavor to that message. And that's why I really like, I'll give you another example. Um, so in, in the Blade Runner world, um, real animals are practically non-existent mm-hmm. and so that's why the owl is real and he goes expensive and she goes very you know that that the, but the owl wasn't real the owl yeah was it repli- was i thought it was replicant no it had the it had the reflecty eyes uh, and, and she said it's artificial it's artificial, it's artificial. oh oh yeah. it, it was oh yeah, okay so, okay so right the, the snake oh, in the so this thing. this still beats up your this still proves the idea no, that it's still horse no 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 okay <laughs> so so here's the thing is like and the horse is so, real so one of the things, so one of the things that I think is a visual cue of who's a replicant and who's not is whoever has like the the, the red shiny, eyes, the shiny eyes, the shiny eyes, the red eyes, and so Deckard has it. And one scene where they're bonding after he's been in the fight with Leon or what I shot Leon or no shot, well I guess both of them, you know the the um, I can't remember what the uh, yeah, things uh, happen. Cassidy's name is um, Johnny Cassidy's character. Uh, but yeah, he's in the kitchen and he's bleeding and whatever. And then, and then he look. it's a long shot mm-hmm. and he looks at her and his eyes are red. I'm like replicant, you he's know, a replicant. they, they did that, that trick by robot. shining a particular light, uh, relatively close to the camera. I know look, how it, they did Into it. the actor's eyes. Right? right. So here she is, she steps up into foreground and you see as she steps up to a certain place, right. Her eyes reflect, and it's clear. So she stepped into the reflecty eye light. Right. And then Harrison Ford, in the same shot, steps forward, and he catches a little bit of that same light. And to me, that looks like an accident. Oh, what? If you read anything about the production on that that movie, there was no accident. He made Harrison Ford run up the stairs like 72 and takes. And that's fine. But if you're going to layer in... Because look... Any, I think it's layered. Any, any sci-fi story where you've got... Uh, replicants that are almost entirely indistinguishable from people, you're always going to have that question mark. Well, what about the main character? Is he? Is he? Or isn't he? He is. You know? Uh, (laughs) He is. So that's fine. I have no problem with the fact that he is. I just have a problem with the fact that it wasn't represented in the story in a way that was meaningful in any way. It was simply... It, there is a shot where he catches some of that light, and you can argue that Ridley Scott meant to do it, and that's fine. But the fact that it's not represented in any way other than a shot that looks like it might have been an accident, you could is but that's galling. but I think that is <laughs> but I think that is one of many many clues. I think the eye thing is one of many. The whole the whole toying with we talked about this the Edward James Almost character the whole toying with Harrison Ford like yeah you know which real. you would see You're in any real. noir story where you have an ex cop who's now like Maybe a so. private dick or a Blade Runner and now they've got this uneasy relationship with the police force that's fine. There is a clue that Ridley Scott mentioned in this particular cut the director's ultimate where final where he said Harrison Ford is a replicant well, that clue? yeah that one no <laughs> the the clue where uh, Harrison Ford is looking at her photos and memories and he he takes a nap or something and he remembers a, a unicorn, unicorn right which is the symbol of something that can't exist so his memories can't exist it's it's a little cryptic but it's a lot cryptic but it was not included in the original cut here's another one that you're right that the original voiceover cut you're right uh, here's another one, um, but also, the do you remember what Edward James almost leaves on the doorstep? Yeah, the little origami right. unicorn, right? Yeah, which but that means, was in the original. Cut. I know yeah. your memories, right? Yeah, but so, but without that other thing, it, ha- it you're right. It, it, it connects, has, it it connects has no, to nothing, and right. therefore has no meaning in the movie, right? So, this is what I mean. Like he's he's decided 
that I, I'll go with you that he actually meant that he was going to be a replicant when right. he was shooting it and it wasn't some afterthought. Right. Fine. But he didn't have the confidence as a filmmaker to say, this is what it is. Oh, see. And I'm going to represent it in the film in a way that means something that an audience could take away. But see, but I think that is part of the fun. Uh, I think by not giving everything away in the narrative, I think, or even heavily hinting at it, I think it's fun. I, as a moviegoer, really enjoy that. I well, love when it, little it, secrets are buried in the movie because then, then the movie keeps revealing itself to me on multiple watches. It's fun when know? the movie has 16 different cuts and, and 50 different releases. <laughs> then then you can explore all those little things that a director didn't quite get oh, in there correctly in the first place. We can talk place. about Dune then. No, um, <laughs> but... The, <laughs> yeah, I, I think... It was an intentional thing to do because it wants to leave the viewer in the shoes of Deckard. Deckard, right. You, you, he doesn't know, now you don't know. Or maybe he's getting the feeling that he knows, and then at the end, with the director's cut properly, it's more evident that, yes, someone else knows his true condition, being a replicant. Yeah. Confirming yeah. it. I, 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 I don't think it's... I don't think it's overly subtle, overly obtuse. I think it's it doesn't. It's in there. You know, honestly, it doesn't. Other than the 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 layering argument or the Easter egg argument, right? It, it doesn't add or subtract anything for me from the story, knowing that he's a replicant. It really doesn't. It's I, still the story of this guy. I still care about what he wants. What's going to happen to him after the credits roll? I I'm, I'm not thinking about that. I'm not thinking about like oh, does he you will. does he have a year? Did he, oh Jesus. <laughs> Because they're, they're doing it. There's a sequel. <laughs> yeah, there it's is. It's going to be so... <laughs> they're doing it. Oh, God. All awesome. CG. It's going to be all CG. As a matter of Pixar is doing it. it picks, it's yeah, all CG. It's going to be all CG. And, yeah. CG uh, there's, Deckard. There's Rated PG be, only, right? Right. Yeah, they're going to blend uh, that universe with the Prometheus universe. <laughs> and the Marvel universe. Yeah. Um, I, uh, there was one other thing I was going to throw out. Oh, um, so the thing I was watching last night was um, I, I had it in watching uh, the uh, the work print. Have you guys watched the work print on that? You know, they threw everything in on this last one. You right, know, right. there's pictures of his kids, you know, his favorite color. I mean, it's like it's, <laughs> it's kind of it's ridiculous. And I was like, I don't think you have anything left. Color you know? swatches from right. when he repainted his bathroom. <laughs> That's right. My favorite his pair of shoes. His precious photos. <laughs> his precious. Um, so, no, I haven't seen the work print. Uh I think I'll I'd ha- I'll have to confirm this, but I think that the VFX shots were that would have been shot sixty five mil, right? To get out to do the opticals, I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure. And then then printed down to thirty five back in the. I mean, we're talking the eighties, early eighties. But here's what I think I saw. Um, I think it's it's been cropped. Uh, what what is it? Is it two three five? Whatever the the aspect ratio is, I, anyway. Seems right. I think that the bars were not on the work print. It felt I remember it being sixteen nine, mm. and I remember in those visual effects shots, I think I see more that I've never seen before. Like there's, I was like, I don't remember those lights over there. Like I was like, oh, because the frame was cut here, you know. Oh, interesting. And it was kind of fun. And then the 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 big one, I was like, oh, that's cool. Was um. So when Leon shoots, um, I forget what the guy's name, at the very beginning of the movie. Yeah. Um, the, let me, I'll tell you about my mom. You know, that whole thing. Uh, that the Every cut I've ever seen, he's shot and goes through that divider wall. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as he's turned, as soon as the thing spins around, it, it's like a hard him, cut. Doesn't he shoot him again? He point? doesn't shoot him again, or he may, I don't know. Um, but every cut that I've ever seen, there's a hard cut there, and it goes yeah. no, no in, the, in the outer space, or not the outer space, the big city, the you know the iconic shot. Um, <laughs> that was my horrible impression of that thing. By the no, way, I got yeah. it. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> if you happen to be a Japanese speaking person, please don't yell at Aww. me. That was my bad impression. Um, but uh, the the shot, there's a there's a second shot that's in the work print, and it's um, that guy. I can't remember the guy's name. Is he's face down and there's a hole in his head. And he's hmm. his face down on a keyboard, and that holds for a second. And it look, looks like a Commodore sixty four keyboard or something. I was like, I've never seen that before. Now, that was really fun. Is it a bloody hole in his head, or is it a replicant hole in his head? Well, his eyes were shut, so I couldn't really. Yeah, tell. but you can tell whether or not there's like. Is there, oh, that. Well, the, well, it's hard to tell. Was is it like a? Is it a bad makeup effect, or is it actually? A, well, maybe yeah. he was meant. To, maybe everyone's. Maybe that's the idea. Is everyone's a, re- a replicant. Everybody's, None of them know they're robots. That's right. Everything's a remix, and everyone's a replicant. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Yeah, and by the way, I love Blade Runner. It's a marvelous film. 
I have no problem with the fact that he's a replicant. I just personally wish that it was better represented in the movie instead of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You're calling bullshit on the nudge, I'm nudge, wink. I'm kind of calling bullshit on and it. And I, I have, as a moviegoer, I just happen to like it. So we we agree to disagree. He can start yeah, cutting yeah. his we, wrist open we agree and going that you're crazy wrong. in the mirror. Ah, that, right. Exactly. That's the yeah. other option. Right. Yeah. All right, gang. Well, shall we jump into uh, uh, how we're, we're pretty far oh, along? Yeah. Uh, so we were going to talk about um, uh, how we and how our, we initially got it uh, got into the business and how what got us started from an interest standpoint and how that developed until we've ultimately got our, our break. Kind of a so. getting to know you uh, to segment know where you. we talk about our career choices, uh, what inspired us, what our paths were, and now how we're trying to get out of it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> or what we're trying to get out of it. Yeah, right. Ooh, oh, well, oh, nice turn. Nice that. turn. Okay, so inspiration. <laughs> Let's begin there. What inspired you originally to make a move towards movies and VFX in, in particular? Well, growing up as a kid in a certain era, um, <laughs> there were it down. <laughs> there were. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't grow up as an place. adult. Yeah. Growing up as an adult everywhere. We had, uh, <laughs> we had televisions. Mm. <laughs> they were in color. Oh. oh most the, of the time. That narrows it down. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, But there were things like uh, reruns of Star Trek on TV and Saturday morning movies and Saturday night movies and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, I never thought about them that much because hmm. they, I guess, were ubiquitous. It's like, oh, Star Trek, that looks old. It wasn't really right. old, but it was old enough back then. It, it was old. Um, and it wasn't until probably, of course, uh, Star Wars, the movie. My mind was blown on some level. But that still didn't uh, instill in me any sort of um, like, oh, that's a movie thing that people do and make movies. It was just like a big, joyous eye candy treat. I bought all the toys and, you know, for years... Captured my imagination like everyone else in our generation. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid cat. <laughs> so it was, media was like this outside thing to you. Right, right, right. I mean, my parents had no exposure or, or experience to it, the makings of it. No one in my family did. We're living in the middle of the country at this time. And uh, just Midwesterners doing our TV watching. And... Uh, Rope it and steers. wasn't until cable television. A lot yeah. of that going on in the Midwest. Yeah. Actually, there's some of that going on Pretty in the good Midwest. in the rodeo circuit. And yeah. um, <laughs> But it wasn't until cable television came about. And uh, I started watching things like um, Alien and other movies I probably shouldn't have seen at that age uh, many times. And then HBO debuted that big, glorious chrome and animated airbrush oh. thing where you fly over the city and uh, into space and into the O. That was a big choo deal. Choo choo and then they had a making of of that. Yep. And I watched HBO more for that logo and the making of the logo treatment more than probably anything on HBO. Uh, I just really loved it and started slowly started seeing that that is something that people do. Um, had a train set as a kid, played with Legos a lot, uh, but still wasn't quite connecting all the dots. Guess I'm a late bloomer um, until. Uh, the Amiga computer came around. I was already into computers pretty heavily. Fourth grade, fifth grade, I was able to buy one, a really cheapy one. Got a Commodore 64 later. Started um, um, really lusting after the Amiga. And one of its big selling points was that it was used video standards. And That's right. It, so therefore, you could record to a VHS tape or something like that straight from the computer. And I started getting into that a little bit, like just paint programs, animation programs at that point. And uh, it, around going to college, that's when 3D software started popping up. Uh, my computer was woefully underpowered for it. And I essentially spent all what should have been my college money, on <laughs> computer gear, software, books, video playback equipment, monitors, on, on, everything not? I could to get my hands on. On a PC or uh, on, on, on the Amiga at the time. The still. Amiga still. Yeah. Okay. In order to start uh, learning software. Now this is forgive my computer ignorance. Uh, I was not an early computer bloomer. Did the Amiga turn into something else like a Windows no, or? Nope. It was always Amiga. 
in, always in I Vegas. I mean, it became the thing you bought in order to run a video toaster. Ah. In fact, I have one in storage. I'll bring it out and show you. A video toaster or an Amiga? An Amiga. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it mean, that's uh, pretty much what it became. The company, it's Commodore Computers, same as Commodore 64. Uh, just, yeah, whatever. They had their own crazy, long, drawn-out internal turmoil and self-destruction. And this was in this was still in the early days where you could compete with Microsoft and Apple hadn't Apple was on the scene but not in a big way and Apple was black and white to begin with yeah and, Apple, and so Amiga was color and had the uh, RCA standard or yeah, Apple right? was starting to uh, kind of fade out Steve Jobs is going to next that's right uh, the next was kind of awesome and dreamy and had a render man built in. Because mm. that was also Steve Jobs and Pixar flirtations going on at that point. And object-oriented programming. Yes. And um, so, yeah, what, I guess what was cool, though, is that I could actually buy something off the shelf or get a video toaster, which at that point for me was just a $2,500 dongle for <laughs> Lightwave, a card this big that was, right. you know, only fit in one kind of computer and only one way. And, um yeah, so that that was when I sort of veering a started veering away from the college tract and into the I can make my own media. Um, what were you studying in college? Uh, yeah, started in computer science, kind of kind of bombed out a little bit, uh, and went into computer tech. This was Purdue. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Got in a fight with my professor. Switched to English. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, partly because I would work in my dorm room instead of going into the lab and print out things on my own printer instead of printing it out on the green bar in the lab. You didn't play by the rules, man. For some reason, that's not what you're supposed to do. Did not play by the rules. I should have hand wrote it, actually. By the way, sorry, do do you remember Vax? Yeah. (laughs) Do you you know what Vax was? I I do not. Vax was the first internet, or our first college-based internet. So, so um, like well, a, it was the first internet e- computers email. that ran on. That was the first computers that were kind of interconnected. That's right, yeah. and you could you could exchange messages back and forth. Mm-hmm. Very. Did you early, have to like early. know the the address of the particular computer and? I uh, you could kind I'm, of I'm code that in by a. Uh, Morse code or something. I honestly, I never or did. I, I use it once or twice. I don't remember using it a lot, so I I don't even remember mm. what it was to be honest with you. It's been so long ago. Yeah, those were the early early days. But yes. colleges were pretty ripe with uh, that technology. That's right. Especially, yeah, Purdue yep. was at that yeah. point. You could go into a lab, and uh, every PC in there would be uh, given an internet address, like an IP address, directly on the internet, which. That's just not even a thing anymore. Right. <laughs> yep. Well, that was the, I mean, that uh, that's how it started. Mm-hmm. It was a research tool mm-hmm. and a way to make non-local but information. That, yeah, I mean, that sort of wraps up the the first, like, the inspiration because I, I start, started connecting the dots, got the computers, started learning the software. And then, I guess from there, it would be like, how did you, how did you learn it? But... Uh, so we do that. It was the it, HBO behind the scenes that really that, lit a fire. Yes, and then, it really was. And then <laughs> you saw your in was via computers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, I didn't have probably that grand, profound foresight that all VFX are going to be a computer. It was just like, oh, the computer can make cool pictures too. And uh, Last Starfighter has some computer stuff. And Tron always inspired me. And, mm-hmm. and for those of you who haven't seen the HBO behind the scenes or that old HBO logo, it's worth seeing. You can find it on YouTube. It and is. there was no computer anything. No. I think the the one thing that they may have used computers for is the, the camera, I think, yeah. was uh, motion control. There's probably motion control. Very early days of MoCo so that they could basically do multiple passes for lighting and, and atmosphere. But it looked really high tech. That chrome, yeah. that was back when chrome, everything was chrome. Chrome and neon. Yeah. Chrome and neon. But like it felt futuristic. It felt cutting edge. At mm-hmm. the, it was cutting edge it at was, the time. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, we want to, want to do this in phases? Oh, yeah, then, yeah. Okay. Let's, so, let's spread so it out. Me? Okay, yeah. so uh, inspiration. How uh, how did I? Well, you know, when I was a kid, I was uh, I was really into just drawing. So Bugs Bunny and uh, uh, Disney cartoons, most, mostly Bugs Bunny. I would draw, and I, I I made my own comic books and flip flip books. I started getting into animation in flip book form uh, when I was probably like eight years old, and I uh, was fortunate enough to have an older brother who was into film, 
uh, into media as a, as a hobby. And through the school, he was getting his hands on Super 8 cameras. And he, would, uh, he was shooting little live action things and sometimes doing some stop motion. But between projects, he would bring the camera home and he would just F around at home. And he would get me to help him with mindless tasks. Like, here, I'm going to animate something and you just click the camera every now and again. And uh, at one point, he took one of my flip books that I really liked and he pinned it up on the wall and started shooting it. And he would rip off a page and then take a frame. And I was freaking out. I'm like, you can't, you're ruining it. He's like, trust me. Trust me, I have a vision. <laughs> and, you know, and that's where it all began. So we'd shoot all these various different tests, anything from animating to blowing something up to you know using uh, uh, fluorescent tube lights as lightsabers or whatever. We'd just shoot all these different things. And then we'd get the film back in a, you know, a couple weeks. And we'd look at it, and I was just so enthralled with how this stuff looked. I was like, oh, we're making magic. It's magic. And then, of course, all the behind-the-scenes things. Like There were these tremendous behind-the-scenes documentaries on Star Wars, the whole trilogy that the BBC produced. You can still find them. They're they're awesome. Uh, all of those things really got me excited. But I never really, I never really saw a path as to how I could get to Hollywood per se. But I did set my mind on when I am when I'm twelve and I'm old enough to be in that extracurricular film club. I'm gonna get my hands on those film cameras and start making my own movies. And I'm gonna do all the the fun magics. So that's what I did. I started just, um, I, I started with uh, stop motion stuff. I started animating uh, hand drawn, uh, hundreds of hand drawn uh, pictures, doing hand drawn animations when I was 10. And then when I was 12, I started doing the stop motion and doing double exposures. We had a back winder so you could wind the film back and, and double expose it and do it, just do all that crazy stuff. So that really set me on a path of making films. Uh, and I had a, a strong influence with visual effects and doing doing the, the, all the sort of magical work that would eventually take me to uh, doing work in visual effects. And we'll get there later. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. Next time. What? How about you? Um, I am not in the visual effects business. Hmm. And, no. Um, How did uh, you get in here? Yeah, exactly. Who was that guy? Uh, I got started, um, or I got uh, my first... Uh, I drew too when I was younger, you know, and in school when I was bored, I would do the the, the flip sketches. Um, and I remember the first time I I, I conceived or I, gra- I wrapped my mind around what a cut was. The first cut I ever did creatively was in a flip pad. Hmm. And I had a little car that went and jumped a ramp, but I made a mistake. The ramp was too close to the edge of the paper. And so I couldn't show the car landing. So I was like, how am I going to show the car landing? I was like, I guess I'll just start him like it's coming in from the left and leave the ramp out. And so you flip through and the car jumped off the page and then landed on the left side of the page and drove in. I made a cut. That's fantastic. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that and for you, me, that was like light bulb. And you it know, worked. It totally worked. It was, it's an actual cut. You yeah. know, it's a new scene, you know. So that was my first inkling of like how that worked. Um, but uh, I... Uh, like everybody else saw Star Wars, blown away. Could not believe what I was seeing. And that was the first time um, that I had, did not see 2001. I think, frankly, I would have been bored, you know, as a kid through that. But Star Wars had everything. Um, you know, interestingly, and so I became a huge fan of Star Wars, got the toys, blah, 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 whatever. I, too, did a um, just one that I recall, one-stop animation thing. My uncle had an 8-millimeter camera, and... Uh, my dad and I said I made a little green monster out of Play-Doh. We did a little stop motion thing. And then I had an X-Wing fighter, a little die cast toy, die cast metal toy that I flew around. It made no sense. It was like, I think he was trying to eat the X-Wing fighter. I, you know, whatever. But I remember specifically, um, well, two things. Gadgets. Um, I was a huge James Bond fan growing up. And so my thing I couldn't wait before Star Wars came out, it was about Bond. Mm. You know, Roger Moore, James Bond. And those were the gadgets. That's where the techie stuff, that's where my brain started clicking like, oh, I like techie stuff. And then Star Wars. But the thing that I remember probably was the most influential thing. There was a book. I grew up in Indianapolis in the Indianapolis downtown library had this giant coffee table book. And it was special effects. And Mm. you guys have probably seen it. Um, But it is, it had like all kinds of still frames from Blade Runner, from Star Wars, from a whole, I, I think it was basically ILM's book, you know. Um, but it 
and this was before I actually saw Blade Runner, were the pictures of Blade Runner. And two things stood out for me. I kept going back to the Blade Runner pictures. I had Star Wars in there. I think it had a lot of stuff. I think it might have had Empire stuff in there. I don't remember when it uh, when the book came out. It was pretty, it was mid-80s. But the two things that struck me about Blade Runner were it was a vision of the future that was not, 80s Logan's Run kind of it was dark and gritty and it felt real to me. The other thing too is I could not wrap my brain around how cool the design was. Mm. It was so innovative and a lot of that, a vast majority of that Sid Mead, you know, mm-hmm. and I later got on to who Sid Mead was. But I think that was the you know, then I I eventually got into computers and that kind of thing and then uh learning that you could make pictures with the computers also with the Amiga. Um but I think that that book was probably the most influential thing of like, how do I do that? I want to make that. That is so cool. You know, especially the spinners. There's something about the spinners that just something in my brain just, you know, light bulb, my brain went off. But, um, but this entire time, never in a lifetime did I think this was a job. Somebody did that. Somebody was hired to do that. You know, that never crossed my mind ever. I just somehow it just existed and that was awesome. And if I could play and make things look kind of like that, then that was, you know, good. So, um, and, and then I eventually went into college and still didn't have an inkling of visual effects really until much later that that was a pursuable, a viable job. You it's know? like mimes or race car drivers. You just don't imagine that you can do that for <laughs> a living. Or both. <laughs> or doing both. Miming just... it. It's safer if you mind that you're in a race car. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so then... Do, shall we jump on to the next phase of um, uh, formal training or, or informal training? Yeah. Software? Sure. Or sure. your path? How did you How did you get from inspiration to yeah. perspiration? Well, what's, the, what's the connecting yeah, mine, part? Yeah, mine did sort of dovetail together, like, directly. When when I saw that the computer could do the things, I was like, like, again, no big revelation that it was just like, I can use this to make pictures kind of like they have in the movies and you're like the hell with the sun i'm gonna do this (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah just get in the basement with the computer and start working um yeah the in terms of formal training i uh was a pretty enthusiastic uh uh photographer in high school days and and into college as well uh developing my own film and all that uh took pictures for a yearbook a little bit um i think (laughs) <laughs> the irony is my high school actually had a radio and television department, pretty capable. They had their own radio station, just like a college would, but it was high school. Uh, I never really got near it ever. The, again, I guess I'm just not connecting the dots. They had a few computers. I did those, took computer classes until there were no more, um, including the mandatory typing class. That's always important. Gotta, Actually, got to take typing. Hugely important. Way more important <laughs> than I ever gave it credit for at the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, the early days of the internet, this is where this goes. Um, so now I kind of knew that I wanted to do that 3D thing. Uh, 3D was just beginning to uh, be talked about on television. We're going from 90 to 90. Three-ish zone, right? So Jurassic uh, 90, Park had happened. Yeah, that yeah. Whole. Actually, yeah, probably even a little later, like ninety-three-ish. Um, but the whole build-up to that, like, how did how did I learn this stuff? How who who could teach me? It's, there's a graphics class in college, but those guys are just using PageMaker to print things on laser printers. It's not what I'm doing. Uh, plus, I already knew all that because of high school work, graphic design, t-shirt shop kind of thing. So um, found out, you know, my dad worked for the university, had access to email accounts and stuff. I found Usenet. I found um, an, e- an email list. There was some email lists starting to happen uh, where I, people would just exchange tips and tricks about software. How do I make something look like water? How do I make a gradient in the sky? How do I model a bear? Whatever it is. These things were started to, starting to be talked about. And... Uh, you start to recognize names and, and finding people. I moved to uh, Ohio for a short stint. There was a special interest group out there, and there was this prolific uh, 2D animator who was known for animating a cartoon squirrel, Amy the Squirrel, named after the Amiga, because hmm. that's his tool of choice was the Amiga. There was a Disney animator cell software, 
And so, um, within, there was there was a Disney. Yeah, it was oh, Disney branded. That. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And within um, within those little confines, a slightly bigger city in Ohio, more Amiga users, couple Amiga stores. Uh, that I started becoming known as the 3D guy, and he was the 2D guy. Eric Schwartz, if I didn't mention his name. And uh, that was kind of cool because now there's like a meeting every month. And so you have this little goal of like, what am I going to show them this month? Will it even render in time? You know, and so <laughs> we would take kind of turns like uh, it was just a meeting in a, I think it was in a high school, like rooms that the community could use. That's and, cool. uh, you know, they'd have a computer set up. I'd put in my floppy, load for a minute and a half and show you 10 seconds of animation. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, it was a floppy. It wasn't a tape, at least. It wasn't a cassette tape. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, soon after that, I um, moved to, to Michigan for like financial reasons and just to expand my horizons a little bit because like, I, I tried school again, get good grades, but getting nothing else out of it. Um, there was an even bigger community up there in the Detroit area uh, for a specific to 3D special interest group now so instead of just an amiga users club or something like that it was really a 3d sig and uh i knew about that from mentions in um, a magazine as well as the lightwave mailing list um things like that plus there was a guy who got a a a local emmy for his short animated short robo jr and he was somewhere in livonia Michigan, and he attended these 3D SIGs, I found out through word of mouth, and plus it was one of the only stores in town to buy new Amiga stuff. Um, Started going to those meetings, had a couple lousy day jobs, but I decided to go at that point. That was when I went full barrel in, forget college, um, let's just get all the stuff, and this this is when that all happened. Mm. Get all the things, get all the toys, uh, accelerate the computer, max out the RAM, And started making demo reels, made a little side company trying to do business without really knowing what we were doing. Uh, Nothing was really established, but there was a big video market in Detroit, uh, thanks to the car companies. And through the Lightwave mailing list and the 3D SIG group, it started getting a feedback loop of how to do stuff or what people are looking for, or even just plain inspirations, a couple butt kickings like... Uh, you guys saw on the Lightwave mailing list that Foundation Im- Imaging is putting out a, you know, they're looking for people. Like, they need artists. They need uh, animators. We are all animators back then. And, um, you know, it was sort of like, you guys are good enough. And that, this is Dale, the guy who created the short, started talking to us directly. You guys are good enough. You guys got to get your demo reel and send it out to them. We're like, eh, I don't know. It's still, I don't know. Why, <laughs> so why, why didn't you, were you, why were you hesitant? Um, it just, again, I guess there was that disconnect. Like, I, I, like, did you know it was like a move to L.A. kind of thing? I it felt, yeah. I, I mean, I started feeling it. And then, you know, uh, my friend Kevin Quattro, Q, and I uh, hooked up around that exact same time. We're both doing the same kind of process. Uh, lightwave mailing list buying computers, 3D SIG, <laughs> buying computers. Uh, just That's pretty much our lives at that time. We just keep doing it and doing it, writing things out to VHS tapes, bringing them in, showing them off, answering questions. People would ask us questions. We'd ask questions. Uh, met a couple developers out there um, who would have bigger roles in the future. And beta testing software, which is pretty cool. And, and then this opportunity opens up in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. The, so through the Lightwave mailing list, it's like, hey, we need Lightwave artists. And Q and I have, you know, a smattering of things. It's not really a demo reel. It's just like I made a spaceship move. He made some plane crash. He <laughs> made uh, weird abstract art things. So we started trying to make it into what we thought a demo reel was. And we had these little MPEG cards that would stream off the hard drive and go straight to a VHS tape and... <laughs> and anyways, it got to the point where it was essentially yeah, days and nights doing this, still keeping the day job. And uh, Q, he got a demo reel that I was like, that, that's good enough. You know, I think there's enough here. I mean, it's not exactly what I see on TV, but I, I just have a feeling it's good enough. 
mine, eh, then maybe. We send them both off. <laughs> Q gets starts getting the phone calls like, hey, come down to see us. Uh, check it out. Let's talk. And uh, Come down to see us in L.A.? To L.A. Okay. From Detroit to L.A. Right. And so they fly him out there, talk to him, and offer him a job. Was he was he like I'm a rock star at this point? I mean, his his mind was blown. Uh, right, I, I'm sure. Right, <laughs> and so I was like, oh man, that sucks. You got it, and I didn't. Um, but did they see my reel? <laughs> <laughs> Surely they haven't. Uh, so he's like, yes, they saw your reel, and I was like, so what did they say? And the note was just more. They need to see more. Mm. I'm like, oh. Okay, more. Well, here's my evil plan. (laughs) You have to obviously pack up and move. You're not going to turn this down, right? So you're packing up your house, your everything, quitting the job, stuffing it in a car, going to L.A. I'm going to help you move. In the meantime, (laughs) took a few days off work, uh, literally just a few hours of sleep a night, getting a Pentium 90 megahertz and a Pentium 100 megahertz to render some stuff for me. Like now, instead of one spaceship flying across the screen, it's three and the camera moves a little better and the stars are anti alias properly. And uh, I was rendering f- 30 frames per second interlace because I thought it was so cool that you had all those frames per second and looks like garbage, of course. But at the time, I thought it was cool. And um, just pushed and pushed and pushed to get all these new things added. Uh, rode it out to the tape, hopped in the car, drove, you know, most more than halfway across the country to L.A. And uh, how long did that take? Two or three days? <laughs> yeah, three days, yeah. I think. Yeah. And uh, then I guess the next part of the story would happen. But yeah, you kind of just checked Q in to work. It was like a Friday, and they're like, "Oh, see you Monday," and they threw us in what was brand new to them at the time, a company condo, because they knew they were going to be hiring lots of people from around the country. They needed a place to stash them for a while until they got settled into town. Oh, a super quick background on this. Um, This was, it was now becoming viable to do a, a, a big production on consumer computers. This was a first. The Amiga allowed this to happen, right? Because before yeah. that, what it was, it was big, giant, expensive, like um, what, what were they? Silicon called? graphics machines, so, uh, right? Yeah. SI or uh, whatever they SGI. Were, SGI. Um, and 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 Ron Thornton and Foundation Imaging was the first, uh, to my knowledge, uh, go at creating visual effects television with consumer computers, and so it happened to be a night. Although you were talking about Pentium, uh, did you know yeah. these were? Were they running now? Was this running on Amigas there? Or was it running? It was running. On I PCs was using that, everything Amigas okay. and PCs, primarily PCs, just because of the speed. You're right. Okay. I, I, they started to pull ahead and Amiga started fading. But this was uh, now, uh, that was right. It started that end of the story was probably in exactly the end of 1996, beginning of 1997. Gotcha. So January 97, I'm in LA, Q's got the job, and I'm coattailing it in there. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, <laughs> and Q, gotcha. Did Q eventually get you in, or did was your demo reel... Well, they, 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 that's the next part of the story, I think. You get away with that, you get away with that. Oh, oh, away with that. really? Okay. How did it really begin? Oh, the suspense. Mm-hmm. Ah. Cliffhanger. Uh, so... Shall I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Inspiration to perspiration. So, okay. So, uh, I think where we left off. Uh, I, I, so the movie bug had bit me. I was very much into uh, making films. Uh, and I started when I was a kid, all through high school, and then went to college, really not knowing what the hell I was going to study. Um, didn't really have the money to go to college and was kind of sweating that aspect of the whole experience. But, just went to the University of Maine in Orono. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna jump in. I'm gonna figure out the whole financial thing as I go. They don't really have a film program, but you know, I'll take some film related courses and then maybe I'll transfer it to a film school uh, because ultimately I wanted to direct. And um, the, the financial thing never really did work out. And what ended up happening is I got involved in an extracurricular film uh, the club, essentially there, and we we put together. What was a, what was meant to be a, a campus soap opera, sort of a murder mystery soap opera, turned into a murder mystery uh, ninety minute feature. It was not meant to be a feature. It just we didn't have time to break it into episodes. By the end, by the time it was done and we we aired it, actually we screened it. 
uh, on campus, it was fully 90 minutes. So I'm like, wow, we just did a feature. Cool. But never in here in any of this time was I ever interested in computers. And that's probably because I have three older brothers who are all mega computer guys. They were the they were the guys, you know, doing everything from the ground up, getting the first, you know, abacus and and programming. And I just was like, I just wanted to draw pictures and play with clay and whatever. And so that's what I was doing. And so so now I'm doing doing these films and I still love visual effects and I still love animation, but I'm just kind of I'm getting it in there when I can, you know. I'm doing a little a little animated sequence here or whatever there, but it's you know it's usually it's usually rough. Uh, but then you know the college thing didn't really it didn't work out in a traditional sense. But what I ended up uh, getting from that was I I started a film uh, independent film company with a buddy that I I worked with in college. We moved to Portland, Maine, and started making independent films there for like the next ten years. So basically, my entire twenties. I was just making independent films and really trying to build my chops as a director. And visual effects never, they, it never went away, but it was never my focus at the same time. And my day job was editing. I was editing uh, for a local commercial and industrial house, doing like lots of little things. And sometimes I'd have to use, you know, Photoshop to, to create some some graphics. And so I, you know, the, I started getting into computers in that sense. I'm like, okay, I have to use a computer. Fine. I'll, <laughs> I'll do some Photoshop. And I started to really like Photoshop because I, I, you know, you, you can do some fun stuff. Right, you can see what you, yeah. You know, photo manipulation and things like that really got me excited. And that's, that's sort of akin to visual effects because you, you can make illusions. Mm. Um, and then the first visual effects I did at that job was I was like, you know, I think I can, I can animate some stuff with Photoshop. Uh, so I started frame by framing animations with Photoshop effects and then writing them out to tape one frame at a time. It was idiotic <laughs> because <laughs> because at the time After Effects had it existed, it existed and I just didn't know. <laughs> right, right. I, you know, no one. I I didn't know anyone who was doing this stuff. So someone did finally tap me on the shoulder and say, you know, there's this thing. It's like Photoshop. So I started to just play around with After Effects. And uh, and even then, even when I started playing with After Effects, I still didn't know half the things it did. I didn't know about masks or rotoscoping. To me, rotoscoping w- w- was what was done in the behind the scenes things, like for Indiana Jones or whatever, where they're painting out Indy's legs one frame at a time on right. cells. I'm like, I get cells, I get one frame at a timing things because that's that's the world I came from. Got it. You you brute force your way through it with ink and paint. Got it. So. The first time I got the impression that I could do visual effects was on one of my films. I was like, you know, I think I think I've learned enough now, and I think the technology is there that I can run, I can digitize the video, do effects, and then spit it back out to tape because everything had to go back to VHS, right? Uh, which is seems ridiculous now, but that was the time. So, uh, so I did a, a short film that was intended to, to sort of test my chops. And I'm I'm rotoscoping things one frame at a time. I'm painting Oof. masks one frame at a time. The whole thing. I didn't know it works. I mean, it still works. It, you sure, know, yes. right. you know. Right. Um, but boy, I, I learned the I had to learn the hard way with everything. Uh, so <clears throat> ultimately, my path was trying to expand my ability as a as a director making films. I always love visual effects. I love the, the the kinds of stories that that use that as a tool in storytelling. And so, I started I started learning how to do visual effects through um, through making my own films. And and if I got frustrated that I couldn't do a particular thing, like when I did that first uh, that first short that had visual effects in it, it was all two D stuff. There was really almost no three D in it because I didn't know any. Mm. I tried to learn while I was doing that. I was trying to learn three D Studio Max from a book. Oof. which yeah. I qu- very quickly learned you can't really do. Um, so I kind of gave up on 3D after that for years because I'm like, screw this. I'm just <laughs> going to do what I know how to do and uh, and make my film. So uh, that's that's I'm going to end there, and I can pick, pick that story up later. But Sean? And three, 3D, learning 3D is like learning to play an instrument. I mean, it's you don't just pick up 3D. I, you know? I used to tell people it was like learning three languages at once. It really is. I yeah. mean, it's and especially if you get into Maya and and everything's that's so specialized and so exotic now, or, you know that it's or so maybe exotic's not the right word, but it can do so much now. It is damn near impossible to know the whole software. It know? is. It's hardest when you're learning it when you haven't 
there's no context. When you haven't really dive, uh, gotten your hands into the 3D world, then the, the concepts and the terminology can be very, uh, very heady and very difficult to sort of absorb. But when my experience now is once you've learned a couple of 3D related it, software, yeah. you, you learn a new one, it's like, ah, old hat. And they also have like, oh, you know Maya? Well, here's a button. To right, they every, cheat. <laughs> everything's, everything's like Maya now in here, you know? It's yep. like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> yep. Uh, so um, I had a little bit of a detour. I didn't go directly into, um, you know, my thoughts weren't even in that direction. Um, and there, we, we didn't have a video production thing in high school, at least not to my awareness. We did have a radio station. I was on the radio station. Um, but uh, so I, I, in high school, I really got more interested in music. And so I thought I was going to be a rock star. <laughs> mm. and you, you, are, you are in your Thank own you. in your own little Thank way. <laughs> you. Oh, mm. uh, but uh, so I pursued music pretty pretty seriously. And um, the first year of college, I went to Milliken, which is in uh, uh, Illinois. And um, uh, I, I quickly realized um, I was uh, I I was a um, hobbyist musician, not a professional musician, because I was surrounded by guys who are. Um, huge or not huge but just great players great players and uh, just recently i discovered um uh actually that, well that's a whole other story uh <laughs> but I, I have a friend now who who i went to school with who's a couple years older than me at milliken who um is now a guitar player for rod stewart nice. and then i have another friend who is a guitar tech who's on tour with katie perry and his uh green day and stuff um uh and so um so basically, I, I was pursuing pursuing music this entire time until after that I realized uh, I'm not gonna make the grade as a musician. By the way, too, I could now. This was back in the days of shredders and heavy metal, and these guys were amazing. Had I pursued that five, ten years later when grunge happened, I'd probably be a musician now, mm. like a professional musician or you know doing a podcast. Because you're saying the, <laughs> <laughs> you're saying the bar was lower in the grunge it, days. It, 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 what was what was valued by the listener in grunge was different than heavy metal. Heavy mm -hmm. metal guitar players were so good and so proficient technically. Like Steve Vai. Steve Vai, he, yeah, exactly. Eddie Van Halen, all those guys, Joe Satriani. And I was never that good. And I played drums too, and that, it was a whole, anyway, really enjoy it, still enjoy it to this day. I've still got musical equipment all over my house. But um, so uh, I, after when I, when that, Light bulb went off like, oh, I won't be doing this professionally. Um, I switched gears and ended up at Ball State University, um, which has a huge, uh, it was called telecommunications then. I don't know if it's still called that or not. But David Letterman went to Ball State and has generously put a lot of money into there. It was the radio and television. Now, I don't, it probably is new media or media something now. But um, but they had a lot of great gear there. And so I got involved in video and that kind of thing there. And um, uh Knew that I wanted to, at that point, I sort of realized, I, I think I want to be in the movie business, you know, and I think I want to be a director and a writer and something with production. I really liked editing, although it was, you know, it was the, it was SVHS with control track and all that. And, but you could go, they, you could take out cameras and go and shoot packages. And, you know, it was very, that was very, more news oriented because they were trying to like steer people where they might get a job. <laughs> you know, there was no <laughs> sense that you're going to get a feature film job coming out of Ball State, but so it was very news gathering, ENG type stuff. But um, uh, so the the real cool thing about Ball State um, was, um, oh man, I'm not going to remember this professor's name, and this is bad that I don't because he was hugely influential for a ton of students. His first name was Dave. Dave, sorry, I'll get it. I'll, I'll remember. But anyway. We'll, we'll mention it next week. Dave. We will. We will. Because this guy was massively influential on a bunch of people. Um but uh, he would he had a lot of connections in 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 Los Angeles and he would place people and um, and he placed me um, at a uh, now this is not my big break, by the way. This is me just getting my toes wet, you know, but uh, I'm my last semester of college. I lived in Los Angeles, so I moved out here right out of the gate um, uh, and I was just paing and that kind of thing. Um, but he placed me in a. Um, uh, a guy who used to be a huge, um, he used to, he used, he used to run, um, ABC, I believe, or, C, or NBC. He's in King of Comedy. The guy that I worked for, he's actually the studio or the, the TV head in King of Comedy. And he actually was at that time. So they actually cast the real guy. And his name was Edgar Sherrick. And I, um, did a, um, uh, 
like a semester internship with him. And, um, uh, through that, um, I eventually got into Photoshop. I have a very circuitous way through this thing. Hmm. So got into Photoshop and then, um, it was trying to cobble together how I was going to go about doing what I was going to go about doing. And I was also starting to get it to get an inkling of how showbiz worked, you know, about the players and the different pieces of the puzzle and who does what. And, you know, where did I want to be in that whole puzzle? You know, and how did how was I going to accomplish the things that I wanted to accomplish as a filmmaker within that structure? And I was now learning the structure and I worked on a movie of the week. Um, and so got to learn and got to be on set and all that kind of stuff. So I lift out a thing. I was in a league of their own too. That was oh, you were? <laughs> yeah. 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 I forgot Did about you? that. It was before, before I, it was in between going to Millican and, um, Southern Illinois and, uh, going to ball state in, in the, there was an interim there. Maybe it was a, I don't remember. It was somewhere in there. Um, but, uh, my girlfriend at the time, wanted to go try out, she wanted to be an actress or a singer at that point. And, um, uh, we went down for a cattle call, uh, for a league of their own. They were just looking for faces, you know? And, um, so we went down and I, I don't, I feel bad about it. I don't think she got called and I went really supporting her and I got called. Nice. Uh, Can we see so, you in the movie? Uh, briefly. I'm just an extra, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, you can, I can point out, nice. I'm, I'm got hot dog. I'm selling hot dogs. Or Cause I, I did, <laughs> I showed up for some extra kettle calls in Maine and I don't think you can see me in the, in the final cut. So. It's always a crap shoot yeah, cause yeah. it's whatever the edit is. And yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So anyway, very circuitous, still circuitous, still not getting the VFX gig. Right. But, um, but, 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 what's, but this is leading up to it. Yeah, so. What's great, though, is that our approaches, our road to Hollywood, totally, totally different. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> I mean, any, anyone's road coming from some satellite region in the United States and trying to That's get right. into Hollywood, trying to make the, the geographic move and also make the leap into that whole culture and to find, you know, a, a job that has some, some imaginable path to what it is that you want to do is that's a difficult thing anyway. But you also have to add in that we, we were doing this at a time when the whole landscape technologically speaking was changing. Visual effects was becoming something that was attainable to do. You you could do it on computers, computers and the internet were exploding where, you know, they, they really didn't exist when we were growing up. So everything, all the, all the elements of of the playing field were really in flux so uh, when I think about it now, uh, you know, it is there there is it's still moving. If you live in the Midwest or, or somewhere else around the world or on the East Coast or whatever, and you you eventually have to move out here, that's always a big decision, you know, because it's it's a life change and it's expensive in L.A. And, you know, and 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 all the normal things that come with 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 taking that risk. Um, the thing that that I think is different now probably is that there are clear conduits how to feed into Hollywood. You know, you go to you know a, a film school or you go yeah, to a cg it's an school. industry it's an industry it has its uh, own its ecosystem own. Yeah, now yeah. and so it's it's not quite the mystery of how you break in you know still getting your first job still a thing but it's not a total mystery on how you well, get into the business i don't think media is as much nearly as much of a, a mystery for kids today as it I, was that's for right. us because yeah, they, because the, the the curtains you know and the doors were all very much shut that's and, right and it just seemed like it was this other thing well, over right. here it's yeah. like it might as well be the moon you know it's oh that's the thing in the sky it's, but now, it's beautiful to look at but now put, put something on vimeo or youtube you, and uh, the world can see it that's right you've got a film studio in your pocket now that's it's, right it's, yeah, it's ridiculous do. uh so so yes now there there are career paths to get there but there are also so, the, everything still just as much as influx as as it was when when we were c- coming into our own right now there's more opportunity but also no clear uh, way in still no, no no you still have to kind of figure out your own path and uh there's no clear path that's set right out for you that's right that's very much and and i think a lot of it eventually boils down to um you know being ready for the big game you know having your chops up to a certain point but in the end it's usually somebody that you know that reaches out you grab their hand they pull you up the ladder you know at least that's that was your experience really early on with q uh, yeah, you know? I mean, it was very, very short ladder at that point, but but, but, <laughs> but it was but, a link. But, but he had done the work. His, ch- his it, chops that's what were I there. mean. He, right. he was he was prepared. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You can't do that and not yeah, be prepared. Yeah, right. Preparation yeah. and luck and timing and all that. Yes. Right. <laughs> but it was interesting. Q and it's great that Q is like, I'm in. 
you know, so you like you breached the gate, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, I'm in. All right. Let's how do we get you in? You know, so. So more on this and other topics in our next right. podcast. That's right. Thanks for listening. See what's, you next time. What's your What's your name? Oh, I don't know if we need to sign off. Well, we, we have an obvious cutting point there if we decide we're not going to use this. <laughs> That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen to that. <laughs> um, I'm Ephraim Patel, and uh, I, uh, I thank you for listening. I'm to PJ just Foley. <laughs> <laughs> to, to just me. Everybody else, screw you guys. I'm PJ Foley at PJ Foley. <laughs> dot com slash your mom yeah um yeah are we giving our tw- twitter handles no i'm, 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 not what we're doing. I'm at ephraim patel so there i'm sean apple and um, um what are you I, at uh, uh, I'm, where, where I, are you at i don't have an at right now you don't have an at. of course know. you have an at i don't you don't what i really don't yeah I'm, i'll i'll come up with one i've got a bunch but i'll whatever tweet me your at <laughs> <laughs> All right, gang. Thanks for listening. 10 Giant Robots is created and distributed by the 10 Giant Robots Radio Network in beautiful downtown Burbank, California. Our theme music was created by the incredibly talented Shane Knight. Follow us on Twitter at 10GiantRobots or at 10GiantRobots.com.